Welcome to the ClearLine Group's e-learning session for sizing Hyperion Planning and Oracle S-based cubes. This session will start with a brief introduction, followed by a presentation that covers data block sizes, potential size of a database, and estimating the data sparseness to determine a practical size for an S-based cube. We will then review what a calculator cache is and how to determine an appropriate setting for it. The session will conclude with an overview on how to use the ClearLine Group sizing utility for SBase and Hyperion planning. I'd like to begin by introducing myself. My name is Steve Light. I'm a director in ClearLine's Hyperion practice. I've got about 17 years experience with Hyperion products. I started on SBase 3 and I've been certified on every version of SBase since version 4. I've also used Hyperion Planning, WA, and Financial Reports, along with a number of other products. I'm a frequent speaker at a different conventions and user groups, and I've also worked across a variety of different industries. The ClearLine Group is a boutique consulting company based out of Chicago. It specializes in EPM. Our consultants have a long history of working with Oracle's Hyperion products, and most of them have worked together for well over 12 years. Many of our consultants are also certified on the various Hyperion products. ClearLine provides its customers with a wide variety of services, ranging from initial assessments and roadmaps to full implementations and production support. We can also review and optimize existing applications or act as mentors to help improve your staff skills. We'll start by reviewing the basics of sizing Hyperion planning in S-based cubes. Everything starts with your outline's dense bar settings and the number of stored members within your outline. This will determine both the size of your data block and the maximum number of data blocks that your outline can create. The block itself is based on the stored members within the dense dimensions, and the intersections of those dense members represent the individual data cells within the block. The intersections of the sparse members represent individual data blocks. There are a number of things that can change your block size and your potential number of blocks. For example, adding or deleting members from the outline, changing member settings like label only or dynamic calcs, or changing your dense bar settings will all have an impact on your potential block size and your potential number of blocks. You should also keep in mind that the dense bar settings have a fairly large impact on your uh, tuning and optimization for your overall cube design. It's important to have a block size of 8 to 100K on a 32-bit box, but you can have a block size of 8 to 300K on a 64-bit box, and you may even have some applications on 64-bit boxes that have much larger data blocks. Here is a simple example showing you how to calculate the size of a data block. The formula is pretty straightforward. You just need to identify the stored members in each of the dense dimensions and then multiply them together times 8 plus 72. In this example, you'd need to multiply the 9 measures by the 66 time members and the 18 scenarios. Then take that value times 8 to convert it to bytes and add the 72 byte block header. The potential number of data blocks is the maximum number of blocks that is possible in the database. This value assumes that every block is created for all the stored member combinations. There's another simple calculation for figuring out the potential number of data blocks. You just need to multiply the stored sparse members together. In this example, you would just multiply the 6 years by the 5 versions, 31 channels, and 3,000 products to come up with 2,790,000 potential data blocks. You can now calculate the maximum size of the cube by multiplying the data block size by the potential number of data blocks. In this case, you'd have a database that the maximum size would be 222.4 gig. This assumes that every block is created and that every cell is populated. This is about as far as the DBA guide or the database statistics can take you. In reality, your cube will be only a small fraction of this number. So you'll need to adjust the size of your cube based on the sparseness of the data. You'll need to make some assumptions on the average number of cells being compressed out on the dense dimensions and about block creation on the sparse dimensions. You can always load a representative data set into your cube to estimate how big it's going to get. It would probably need to include all of your dimensions for one month, year, version, and scenario combination. You would then have to roll up the cube after the data was loaded so that you could get an estimate on the final size. Assuming that time is dense, 
you would then need to increase the compressed block size shown in the database statistics by about 12 to get a more realistic block size and then multiply that by the number of years, scenarios, and versions you're going to load to come up with a more realistic size for the overall cube. Unfortunately, this usually is not possible during requirements and design. You will often have to come up with a size estimate for your cube before you have data or even before you've built an outline. You can do this by calculating your application's maximum size with the formulas we reviewed on the prior slides and then applying some assumptions on block compression and block creation to your answer to come up with a reasonable cube size. This information can be very useful for requirements, design, enhancements, controlling scope, and for documentation. The next section will cover a brief introduction to the calculator cache. This cache is closely linked to the cube's potential number of blocks and can easily be calculated with the sizing spreadsheet. The calc cache is used to speed up calculation times by creating a place in memory to create and track new data blocks during calculation. Keep in mind that it's only used for new data blocks. The data cache will be used for existing data blocks. This is why it's particularly useful when you calculate your database for the first time, but it has less of an impact on recalculations of the cube. The calc cache is also the only S-based cache that releases memory when the process is complete. You'll need to make sure that you've set up your S-based configuration file to use the calc cache. The configuration file can turn the calc cache on and off. It also defines how much memory is available for the calc cache. Make sure that you either have calc cache true or no calc cache entry in your configuration file. You do not want to see calc cache faults in it. If there's no entry, it'll still work because the default is true. You should also see calc cache high, calc cache default, and calc cache low in your configuration file. They set the maximum amount of memory that can be used for the calc cache and are called by the set cache command high, default, and low in your calc script or business rule. SBase will use one of three types of calc caches when it's aggregating the cube. The single anchor multiple bitmap is the best calc cache, but it also needs the most memory. The single anchor single bitmap is a little less effective, but it requires less memory. And the multiple anchor single bitmap is the least effective cal cache, but it also requires the smallest amount of memory. Unfortunately, there is no way to directly select the type of cal cache you're going to use. The application will simply use the best of the three types of cal caches that fits into the reserved memory that's being called from the configuration file by the set line in your calculation. The good news is that you can control what it selects by completing the following steps. First, you need to determine the memory requirement for the best calc cache based on your outline. Then you need to identify the calc cache setting in the configuration file, calc cache high, default, or low, that's big enough for it to be selected. Finally, you just call that setting from your uh, calc script with the set cache command. The formulas for calculating the size of the different types of calc caches is fairly easy. We'll start with the single anchor multiple bitmap since it's the best calc cache. You'll start by first identifying the bitmap dimensions and the anchor dimension. The anchor dimension is the last sparse dimension in the outline and it should also be the largest one to calculate the best calc cache. The bitmap dimensions are the remaining sparse dimensions. The formula has you multiply the actual numbers from the bitmap dimensions together and divide it by 8. So in this sample it would be 20 times 20 times 50 times 50 divided by 8 to give you 125,000. Then add the two constant bitmaps to the total number of dependent parents in the anchor dimension and multiply their sum by the answer from above. This will give you the total number of bytes needed for the calc cache. So in this example you're going to take two constant bitmaps plus three dependent parents to give you five, multiply five times the 125 to give you 625,000 bytes for the calc cache. Remember, there's always going to be two constant bitmaps for this option. You can also determine the number of dependent parents by 1 plus the total number of alternate rollups in the anchor dimension. So in this sample you have two alternate rollups, so you have a total of three dependent parents. The single anchor single bitmap uses basically the same formula as the single anchor multiple bitmap. You just need to skip the two constant bitmaps and the total number of dependent parents in the calculation. So in this sample you would just multiply the bitmap dimensions together and divide it by 8. 
So that would be 20 times 20 times 50 times 50 divided by 8 to give you 125,000 bytes for your cache. The multiple anchor single bitmap is even simpler to figure out. You basically use the same formula as the single anchor single bitmap, except you now consider the last two sparse dimensions as anchor dimensions. So you would just multiply the bitmap dimensions together and divide them by 8. In this case, it would be 20 times 20 times 50 divided by 8 for 2,500 bytes. Here's the good news. The Clearline Group's sizing utility for Hyperion planning in S-Base does all the calculations for you, so you don't have to remember the details of all the math. The utility is just a three-tab spreadsheet. You just have to enter in your cube's information into the white cells on the first tab. All of the other cells and tabs are protected. Just type in the dimension names, the number of stored members, the total number of members per dimension, and the dense sparse settings. Then enter your estimated block size after compression. 10 or 20% is a good place to start if you're not sure what to enter. The last step is to enter the total number of dependent parents. Remember, this is 1 plus the total number of alternate rollups in your anchor dimension. This sample does not have any alternate rollups, so we're going to leave it at 1. Here's a sample of the input tab. You can see that this is a 7 dimension model with 30% of the block remaining after compression, and that there were no alternate rollups in the anchor dimension. The second tab gives you all of the cube's sizing information, including the block size, the number of potential blocks, and the maximum size of the cube. It also gives you a stoplighted section that applies the block compression, along with rows to represent the varying levels of data sparseness. Green means that there are no issues. Yellow means that the cube with that data volume may be large and slow, and that you might want to avoid complex or multi-pass calculations. And red means that you need to think about redesigning your application to reduce the size of the cube and to improve performance. The third tab provides all of the information for the calc cache. It's also stoplighted to let you know if you go over the maximum size that you can set in your config file. This sample shows that the very best calc cache only needs 349 bytes, the second best needs 116 bytes, and the last one only needs 4 bytes. So you can see that you do not need to reserve very much memory in order to get the best calc cache performance. Now you just need to check your config file and decide whether you want to use set cache high, low, or default in your calculation. I'm guessing you'd probably use low in this case since you don't need hardly any memory to get the best performance. I think you can already see the value of this tool during requirements and design. It will let you do a lot of what-if analysis on your application before you even build it. This will also improve your decision-making process for the design and help you set appropriate expectations with the business. Now we can demonstrate some of the what-if ability and play with the design a little bit before we build anything or promise anything to the users. The first thing we'll do is change our block size after compression from 30 to 90%. You can see that this did not have any impact on the calc cache, but it did increase the size of the database. You're actually creating the exact same number of data blocks, but the data block size is larger after compression and will take up more disk space. You can see some of the stop lighting beginning to change. The 50% of potential blocks being created line is now red, and the 25% of potential blocks being created is yellow. So the design would still work, since you're probably going to create less than 1 or 2% of the potential blocks. Now we're just going to switch the last two dimensions to see what it does to the application. The first thing you'll notice is that this did not have any impact on the data, the block size, or the size of the cube. It did have a fairly large impact on the amount of memory required for the calc cache. The memory requirement for the best calc cache jumped from about 350 to almost 34,000. So the cache needs almost 100 times more memory for the same performance as the original outline. Now we're going to do a little what-if analysis like you might have to do with a user in a requirements gathering meeting. Let's say the user requested that you add a locations dimension with 30,000 members and four alternate rollups, and that they also asked you to increase the detail in the channels and the products dimensions to 1,310 channels and 13,000 products. You probably already know from experience that this is a high-risk design request, 
and now you're trying to quickly explain the impact to the user without actually building anything or using any technical terms. This is a great opportunity to use the sizing spreadsheet to explain these risks. The sizing spreadsheet will easily show the user why this is a high-risk design request. You'll be able to point out that the sizing tab has changed from mostly green to almost all red. This shows that the cube would need to be extremely sparse to even work, and that it would likely be slow if it did work. Plus, the calc cache tab shows that you can never use the best calc cache since it needs more memory than the maximum possible size that you can set it to. Now you should be able to work with your user to come up with a better design. For example, your user may decide that locations really is a must-have, but that the alternate roll-ups and locations were just a nice-to-have that they could live without. They also want to keep the larger, more detailed channels, but reduce the product dimension by removing alternate roll-ups and allowed some of the scenarios to be removed. You might also want to change your compression back to something more reasonable. In this case, we changed it back to 40%. The what if analysis in the meeting also cleared up a communication error that impacted the design. The time dimension can be changed from storing individual weeks to months because what they really wanted to do is to have monthly data updated weekly and they didn't actually need the weekly members. You can quickly plug in this new information into the spreadsheet right in the meeting and see the impact on the design and its potential risk. The cube is going to be a little bigger than the initial design, but it is smaller than the changes the users were initially requesting. You can see on the sizing tab that it's half green now, and that you can actually use the best calc cache with only about 7 meg of memory. So now you have a reasonable starting point to begin building your application. I think you can see why it's really important to have a good idea how your requirements will impact your design before you start building anything. You should always try to avoid making promises on requirements that you may not be able to deliver. And I think you can also see why this is a great communication tool for clients and project managers who may not have a full understanding of the impact of adding members or dimensions to the outline. Please feel free to email me if you would like a copy of this presentation or a copy of the ClearLine Sizing Spreadsheet. My email address is slight at clearmalinegroup.com.